Um, good morning. Uh, yeah, I'm going to um, briefly introduce our teaching program in digital archaeology at Leiden University, where this um, uh, field of teaching, this topic, has a long tradition. Um, it uh, hasn't always been called digital archaeology for a long time. Um, what the colleagues have been teaching were uh, computer applications. Um, and um, what we are teaching is very much related to who the teachers are. Uh, on the one hand, this is um, um, related to the faculty policy of closely linking teaching and research. So um, there should always be a, a direct link between what you do in your research and what you teach. Um, and of course, different people have different expertise. And these two dear colleagues have been around at the faculty since the 1980s already. And uh, you might be familiar with uh, certain aspects of their research. Uh, Hans Kamermans, who established this at Leiden University, um, worked very much along the lines of what John Windliff described uh, in his uh, keynote um, lecture, sampling techniques, digital field recording, GIS applications, uh, leading over to predictive modeling. And also Mirko Wansleben joined the team uh, already in the late uh, 80s. Um, and um, he's teaching statistics, uh, also GIS applications, predictive modeling, and did a lot of research uh, on data archiving. Um, and so that is uh, what has been taught for a long time already uh, at our uh, faculty as core part of the undergraduate teaching in the bachelor's program, in what is now the bachelor's program. Uh, so uh, a couple of years ago, Hans uh, retired uh, and I joined the team. And um, then um, a bit later, we were able to hire Chiara Piccoli um, with a small contract to uh, give additional courses. And once again, we um, are now teaching stuff that we uh, also do in our own research. Uh, in, in my case, uh, this is, uh, for example, remote sensing and digital image analysis. More recently, we have moved uh, into machine learning. And in Chiara's case, once again, going back to the keynote lecture, you might remember um, the nice city model of Koronaya that John Windliff showed. That was Chiara's work. Um, and she's teaching, for example, uh, 3D modeling and procedural modeling, which is a uh, highly popular uh, course among our students. Um, so um, this, uh, yeah, this background informs uh, the structure of our teaching program. And this is an overview. This is uh, constantly evolving, as you can imagine. Um, but there are certain elements that have been um, um, that have found a quite stable place in the curriculum. So digital field recording is uh, taught uh, in the first semester, a lot of uh, digital surveying and, and so on. Um, and this is uh, a very practical course. Uh, and these, uh, this practical knowledge is then applied in the field school. And there's also a course uh, with certain classes on basic statistics and relational databases, very simple level. It's basically teaching students how to collect data and uh, sort them and do some simple analysis. Um, GIS is then taught in the second year. And um, up until this year, there was a third compulsory course on predictive modeling that was basically uh, a second GIS course uh, teaching um, uh, basically methods that are um, used in the uh, archaeological practice in the Netherlands um, uh, of predictive modeling. This will now be changed from a compulsory course in the third year to an um, optional course in the second year because we got a number of complaints from students that this topic is not relevant for everyone. Um, not everyone works on a landscape scale or in this um, context. Um, so um, we will now offer it as a small course for people interested in this subject. Um, instead, there will be some classes on more advanced statistics in the new program. 
And then um, since a few years, we are offering um, a master's track in uh, digital archaeology. This is part of a larger uh, master of science program in which we also teach uh, material culture studies and bioarchaeology. Um, and here uh, the program gets less structured. It's more about giving uh, students uh, opportunity, opportunities to choose. So we have been offering a number of core courses, but not all of them each year. 3D modeling is always in high demand. 3D GIS um, related to that will be offered as a separate course now. We've been able to offer one course on modeling and simulation, and I'm going to come back to that later. And then there are certain uh, topics uh, that are integrated in a larger course, uh, spatial analysis, remote sensing, and data management. Uh, but what uh, is also very important is um, a more theoretical and more reflexive approach about what we are doing with all these techniques and methods. So I've called it here nature and future of digital archaeology. What is the role of digital archaeology within the wider field? And um, there is a lot of recent literature on that topic that was very helpful, for example, by Jeremy Huggett and others. And that uh, leads to heated debates uh, in, in the classroom. So the whole range of opinions can be heard there from uh, digital archaeology as a mere tool to uh, a science or digital archaeology equals archaeology. Um, so uh, that's a very nice topic for discussion and the students have to write an essay about this. Uh, but I, what uh, the thing that for me is most important is that this one year master's program gives uh, the students the opportunity to write a thesis on a subject in of their choice in digital or comp and computational archaeology. And this is an overview of um, the thesis topic so far. Uh, this also gives you an idea of the numbers of uh, students um, that have chosen this uh, program. And you see here uh, a range of, uh, I think, a quite broad range of topics um, that all have in common that the focus is usually or not on a a specific archaeological case study, but more on a methodology. So uh, how are we doing research using digital data and computational tool? What does this uh, offer us in terms of an added value? How can we improve the way we do research? So all of uh, the things developed here are usually transferable to other case studies as well. And we have very general topics like, for example, an investigation into no SQL databases in archaeology, or now I'm looking forward to this one, uh, a student looking into the challenges of uh, long-term archiving of 3D um, heritage objects um, and so forth. Um, so I think um, the MSc students tend, spend most of their time on their thesis, and this is a new opportunity that they can now focus uh, on these topics within the new program. Um, so, uh, briefly, opportunities and challenges. Thanks to the work by Hans and Milko and others, uh, digital archaeology at Leiden University has an undisputed place in the program already uh, on the bachelor's level. So we cover um, basic topics in undergraduate teaching, which leaves room for more advanced topics in graduate teaching. Um, there is um, also beyond the regular teaching program uh, a lot on offer for interested students. We have a very active um, digital archaeology interest group led by Wouter and others, others uh, with regular lectures, workshops and so on. There's also the value group. Um, they are not here in the room, but they are present here at the uh, conference uh, on video games and archaeology. And so there is a broad range of um, things that uh, people can attend uh, next to their regular teaching. Um, the program is in high demand. There are few competing graduate programs at the moment, which leads to a quite international student population. We, uh, our teaching language is English, uh, and this is attractive for many um, students from abroad. This is also a challenge, <laughs> because uh, an international classroom 
um, means that you have people with uh, quite different backgrounds within the same classroom and it's very difficult to bring them up to speed um, within a one-year program. So uh, this is a one-year program and for me this is often too short. I think I, I would rather prefer a longer program but anyway um, uh, when it comes to thesis writing we can do a lot with individual coaching. Um, there is a lot of demand for general skills courses which we would like to offer but cannot due to limited resources. There are constantly changing regulations uh, on levels beyond our beyond what we can influence. Uh, for example, the, the format of certain courses is uh, prescribed. We always have to teach five EC courses. And then things like we now move from linear teaching to block teaching. This has a huge impact on, on what we can do. Um, we are also um, trying uh, out new uh, formats and I um, briefly want to talk about uh, this modeling and simulation course again. So we were able to teach this first course in which our students were actually required to code in a scripting language um, two years ago um, thanks to Filko Skajon and Isa Romanowska joining us temporarily. Uh, this was an online course that we developed for this purpose. Um, and um, we are going to offer this again from September, this time for external paying <coughs> participants and our students. And if you're interested in this, just yesterday, thanks to Ariana and Philip, there was a paper published about this course and our experiences with this in the CIA journal. So if you're interested, please visit the website. Thank you.